Hey, folks, it's Lindsey Huddleston back in the building. Another SBS Ed show with my great co-host, Mr. Terry McCoy Jr. Terry, this is the last show for 2020. Can you believe it? We made it. And uh, with the great help of Orlando Watkins, we appreciate you, Orlando, for everything you're doing and uh, all the great ideas you've continued to bring us. And it's going to be uh, some great things for 2021. But, you know, this is kind of bittersweet, Terry, because I, I remember we kind of started down this road, man. It was hot outside and we were, you know, making it work. And um, we kind of just worked really hard. And we've been dealing with a whole lot with the pandemic of 2020. But everybody's feeling pretty optimistic. I know I am going into 2021. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, kick off the show with some of the things we're going to be talking about. For those who have been listening, there have been a lot of great listeners out there. I want to shout out to Aaron, who's been listening on a regular basis, uh, following up. Uh, we appreciate your support. Uh, keep doing that. And also to the Streets Are Talking uh, podcast network. Actually, I'm going to be bringing in a new year with those guys, uh, Don Houston and uh, Clarence B., Clarence Babor. Uh, in three different time zones, Terry. We're going to be representing all throughout the country. And uh, I'm very happy to know that our show is uh, being one of the top shows on this program. Uh, we're getting a lot of love. I was just on the, on the uh, radio with those guys in Chicago earlier this week. Uh, shout out to Chicago and the work that we were doing out there. So, man, uh, we're growing. And with Orlando's help, uh, we're uh, growing the market in Canada. And to those who are listening can hear us in Canada, we are coming your way. We want to connect with you to get you uh, – uh, motivated about what can come next, uh, doing very well, not only in sports, but as well as in life. So, Terry, what we have on the lineup today, and I want to thank you for being a super producer, putting this together. We want to talk about name, image, and likeness. It's kind of some breaking news, particularly here in Michigan. I get to put my political hat back on when I was Governor Granholm's Deputy Director for Legislative Affairs and talk about this bill uh, that had just passed. Uh, you and I can talk about the predictions for the CFP, the college football playoff, coming right up right around the corner. And, uh, you know, you, you, you allowed me to vent with you the other day, Terry, uh, talking about Booger McFarlane and his comments uh, regarding uh, the dismissal of Dwayne Haskins from the Washington football team. We're going to play that clip, kind of dissect that a little bit. And then uh, bringing it close to home, if you're here in East Lansing, even though I'm a uh, proud Detroit, it's just like Orlando Watkins. I know you got strong uh, 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 Cleveland and uh, Columbus ties, Terry, you know, shouting out Ohio. But Michigan State basketball and the struggles. No, I was on a, a Zoom interview with Tom Izzo today uh, talking about the alpha dog. And we'll talk more about that and how that kind of made us rounds around the Big Ten network uh, and all the way back. And then uh, I appreciate you for this last final topic, talking about our New Year's Eve, you know, and New Year's resolutions, uh, goals and things we're going to do. Uh, I appreciate you posing that question because, of course, it made me think about it. And we're going to get a chance to talk about it. So with no further ado, uh, the name, image and likeness bill that was passed here in Michigan uh, I think it's really interesting, Terry, because now, from what I understand it to be, an uh, individual who signs a contract that allows them to benefit financially from their name, their image, and their likeness, uh, once that is uh, signed uh, prior to them signing to the university that they're going to attend to play sports, uh, they can go on and benefit financially from that. And it's amazing, you know, all the crazy things we've seen in 2020, and this is like the least biggest deal you know, but for some time, Terry, this was always the, the talk. You know, you see the video games with the athlete names on the back. Remember Ed O'Bannon uh, from years ago? He brought that suit, you know, with EA Sports and whatnot. It was a huge, huge thing. So what do you think about uh, this legislation being signed uh, by Governor uh, Gretchen Whitmer? I think, you know, I think this is a key for high school athletes, the big name high school athletes. I mean, the Chet uh, Holgrams and the Monty Bates and, Jaden Atkins, even though has he signed yet? I'm not sure he committed, but has he signed officially? Or Dayton, just, Dayton I believe Jaden signed. Okay. So yeah. like, okay. So like you know, like the players before him are coming up. You know, those kind of guys can, you know, part of the reason why some of these players do go off to the pros, like Moody, RJ Hampton, Lamelo Ball, they're able to make money off of Puma and off these different brands that sign them and pursue them at a young age at 17, I think this is a key. I think, you know, the fact that it's signed in the state of Michigan, uh, it allows guys like uh, Coach Izzo, uh, Coach Jawan Howard, uh, Coach Tucker, and Jim Harbaugh, whoever comes in that Michigan spot, to kind of get the recruiting edge, kind of let them know, kind of let their players know that uh, you are able to, to sign with Nike and it still make some money off that, build yourself, build that brand, We'll talk about that a little bit later with Booker McFarland, but build that brand for you, you know, uh, establish, you know, who you are and make a name for yourself. 
No, you know, you make a good point, man. Um, I got to loop back around to the governor's office. I, I alluded to my past life with Governor Jennifer Granholm and even Mayor Dennis Archer, but the political part of it, and ironically, I was able to have a couple words with uh, Michigan State Athletic Director Bill Beekman uh, just a few days ago, actually on Christmas Day, when Michigan State uh, played Wisconsin. And we were really talking about, you know, all the different things that are happening right now. And even with the governor's office, that while they were working to work on determining how many people can attend the games, because that was an issue with the parents coming up and whatnot, that unfortunately right now, there's not really a liaison or a spokesperson or someone in the governor's office to really interface with these issues. Now, I know it was a bill that was signed in the law. So that was just the legislative part of it. Uh, Representative Joe Tate and another gentleman whose name I forget, uh, Democrat and Republican, had passed that. But I, I think if Governor Whitmer is going to get out here to sign this, uh, I'm going to take it upon myself to uh, try to follow up to say, hey, who's connecting the politics with the sports? Because mm -hmm. right now there's a disconnect. You look at Michigan State, for example, and the fact that you know they want to be able to have more fans. I think people are leading towards you know, because of the management of the pandemic and things like that, being able to uh, get more people there. But who's, you know, uh, being that liaison and communicating uh, the political and the governmental and the uh, legislative talk to the sports side and those things. And I think that's a huge opportunity going forward, considering uh, what we want to be doing in Michigan with getting uh, sports back underway. But that name, image, and likeness is huge. I think that's a huge step. Uh, I think that puts Michigan State, and I think he even said if we talk people like Mel Tucker, in a very unique position from a recruiting standpoint. I think that was an excellent point. Because if you have a young athlete who's contemplating, you know, Michigan State or a said, you know, school outside the state of Michigan, that may be the one thing that put them over and say, okay, well, I'm with that. I'll get a chance to benefit from my name and likeness, you know? Right, exactly. I think that is what a lot of players, because I mean, brands now, I see, you know, like Anthony Edwards signing with Adidas. You know, I see younger, uh, younger athletes getting that shoe contract a lot earlier. And now it makes me think like if they're signing them when they get to the league, maybe they might even per start pursuing high school athletes. The ones that had the names like Zion Williamson, we knew he was going to be number one, uh, the number one draft pick whenever he came into Duke. So I, I think that a lot of these shoe brands and deals are going to start going after these young, these young bulls. I like to say while they're young and get them going. Yeah, you know, but also I think we have to look at this too, look at it in tiers because we have the, you know, the Ball brothers or whatnot who are definitely, you know, fit into a category like this or they did, if you will, uh, the Zion Williams, these top guys for these top, you know, uh, shoe companies, Nike, Adidas, and Puma. But what about the guy who's trying to come up? It's not necessarily an Under Armour, but what about the guy who it may not be a shoe deal? Oh, because one thing I think you have to point out that the contract that the athlete signs cannot conflict with the school's current sponsor. And that's huge. Uh, so, yeah. you, know, Ni you know, Nike, Michigan State is a Nike school, been a Nike school, go probably always be a Nike school. So you can't come in with a Puma contract. So, but, but what I'm getting at though, if it's not necessarily the shoe deal, what about smaller businesses? Shout out to Easy Work, one of the SPS ad sponsors. Oh, yeah, yeah. May want to say, I want to get my product. Shout out to uh, Desmond Ferguson and Moneyball. Des just did a license agreement with Michigan State that definitely puts him in a position that, you know, what if he has a money ball athlete? What if a kid gets recruited and they're going to rock all uh, money ball? And then in Des particular case, someone like Desmond Ferguson, because you've already have a license agreement with the university, that means that they can rock money ball gear in some way or form and not necessarily be in conflict. I mean, I bet they're you probably have to get lawyered up, but I think it's huge. But more importantly, I don't think so for the big brands, Terry. I think for the smaller companies. And this whole internet, IG, social media, you know, uh, uh, business to, to consumer type world, you don't necessarily have to have a multi-million dollar marketing campaign and be a big brand like an Adidas, you know, a Nike right. or Under Armour or whatnot to, to have access. If you can go to a kid and say, listen, man, we're a small company, but for the course of four years, we're going to give you $100,000 to be right. able to rock our brand, not necessarily on the court, but just as be affiliated with it. You know what I'm saying? Now, come on, now, that's a whole different move. And if you're a smaller company and you say, hey, all we want is a little market share. All we want is a little area to get into. So I think there's going to be a lot of uh, opportunity there, but it's only right. I think people are kind of catching up and maybe it takes a pandemic for somebody to say, hey man, these whole thing about athletes making money is not a big deal, but who knows, you know? <laughs> right. And that, that's the one thing about all this with 2020. A lot of people think it's such a bad year, but it, it has brought some good things out, whether it's just social injustice, uh, 
you know, promotions to end that. And, you know, with now athlete, athlete likeness and, you know, their image, it's 2020 has brought a lot of good things out. So, okay. yeah, you're right. So with that, as we're moving on, man, I appreciate you bringing that up. I think we're going to uh, double back to that. That could be something that will be on our radar for 2021 and also give a crossover opportunity for the sports world and the political world to kind of meld in a positive way to benefit these young people and to benefit society going forward. But let's talk about the CFP, the college football playoffs, man. It's that time. I mean, again, as we wrap up and do the last show of 2020, there was a time when we would say, hey, is there going to be college football? And here right. we are Perry, right now talking about the college football playoffs. Uh, you've done a great job in uh, keeping an eye on that, what's going on. Why don't you talk about what you see and we can kind of uh, give some thoughts and opinions about this college football playoff situation. What do you have? I think there's a lot of dynamics in this college football playoff. I think this is probably the most, other than the first one when Ohio State arguably probably shouldn't have been in there, the first one that they won. Uh, I think this one probably carries the most storylines just because of the fact that some people don't think Ohio State should be in there and being 6-0 and and not playing a, a full-length season as other teams. Uh, Ohio State trying to get their first win over Clemson, period. Um, you look on the other side, you got Alabama. Can they continue their dominance, uh, you know, after a big win over Florida? And Notre Dame, who most people said they shouldn't be in there because they got stomped out by Clemson on a neutral side field. You know, there, they got stomped out. <laughs> and, I mean, they barely got a touchdown on the board. So, I mean, uh, uh, Notre Dame's facing it, uh, some heat, and Ohio State's facing heat. Clemson's on a little pressure because Dabo's over here making claims saying Ohio State should be number 11. It shouldn't really be in there. Oh, I stand by my thoughts. And, you know, I think both teams, Notre Dame and Ohio State, are in a good spot. Do I think Notre Dame is going to win? Right now they're at a 19.5, like, point spread. I don't think it's going to be that high scoring for them. I, I think Notre Dame doesn't get uh, the amount of credit as they should. Alabama's defense isn't as good as what most people say, but – I think it's going to be a closer game. I have Alabama winning by maybe two touchdowns, maybe a touchdown and a field goal. Uh, I think, you know, Devontae Smith and Mac Jones get a lot of the credit. But Najee Harris, man, I feel like he is really the, the, the key value of that offense. I mean, if you can run the ball on any team, I think you're setting yourself up for some gold. You're setting yourself up for a nice win. And so I think Alabama's going to get this one. Now, my favorite one, they got Clemson as a touchdown favorite. But I, mean, I think Ohio State, man, I think this is the year. It's 2020. Everybody's been on Justin Fields' head. I think this is the game that makes Justin Fields' legacy moving on to the NFL draft. I mean, he uh, he is uh, cold-blooded. I mean, a guy that stays even killed throughout the game. And I think that he said he's prepared for this game like no other. Uh, he's been getting a lot of heat, man. He, he hasn't really struggled throughout his whole career because he's he's been that dominant. But I think this is his game. I think Clemson, uh, their secondary can kind of be a little exposed. The fact that Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson weren't named in the AP All-American, not first, not second, or third. I felt, I felt, you know, my heart kind of dropped for that one. But, I mean, I think Ohio State, this is the year 2020, or 2021, I should say. But the 2020 year is the year we get it done. We beat Clemson. Yeah, I know you got a little, a little extra bias because that Ohio State – piece going on with you. But no, you make a very valid point. You know, I want to speak on both uh, Clems, excuse me, on Ohio State and uh, Notre Dame. And just my view, man, and, and a lot of this goes with the leadership. And I have no reason to slight Brian Kelly. I've been in this orbit before years ago at a sound body, sound mind camp. And ironically, I had a, a long conversation with both Urban Meyer, as well as uh, Jim Harbaugh some several years ago. But I just don't think that despite the influence that the Notre Dame alumni have, that this institution has is one of the greatest institutions on the planet. Despite their influence and their long reach, I don't think that they're at the point that they're an elite program amongst elite programs. And I'm not saying that to, you know, uh, be blasphemous and no pun intended with that, but look what happens. You just said it yourself, them boys get stumped out bad on the playground, man. I mean, when it really come down to it, even for years when they were in the national championship years ago, you know, you can get all these hype, this hype and expectation because you put, you know, we can put great worth into the institution. I mean, we know out of, out of the four schools, Right. The group from Notre Dame, baby, is go 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 take you a little bit further if there's a way to, you know, if something can be taken further compared to the other. And it's not slighting the academic, you know, rigors of uh, both Ohio State, excuse me, Alabama and Clemson. But I think that's as far as, as elite as Notre Dame is when it comes to this open 
football and basketball. I'll be honest. Maybe it's not fair to even bring basketball in it. But I just think that that's going to uh, allow them to continue to fall short. And, and, and it may have a little bit to do with that, with that, with that, you know, island hopping that they do with that ability to move around and get into another conference and being able to just set up a game as opposed to what big 10 is big 10, baby, you know, sec is sec through and through and to Ohio state. Uh, I want to give them a lot of credit. I just wonder if the idea of them only playing six games becomes this albatross around their neck. It's like this big weight to carry that, you know, do they really even believe they should be in there? You know, will the slightest piece of adversity or slightest challenge make them think, you know, maybe everybody was right. Is there something psychologically, you know, impactful about only having played six games to the other, you know, teams that have played longer? Uh, I bet if I can convince anybody that, you know, these things don't matter, it will be you. I know you want to be like, hey, it's all about Ohio State right now. But, you know, I only speak that, say that because you did an excellent job at the start of this by saying there are several storylines. And those are the two dominant storylines I follow. And, hey, man, let's, let's – let's, Nick Saban, Nick Saban and Dabo, 10 games. I'll give Nick Saban seven of the 10, you know, uh, at the end of the day. And I know right now it's been different because Clemson has pretty much come on board. But Mick, Nick, man, Nick Saban is, 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 is the originator at this point. You know, at the end of the day, the best, you know, coach in college football only because of what he does. And I think that Clemson has benefited from learning from Nick Saban. Those losses have helped them. So at the end of the day, I'll give Alabama the edge overall in the national, excuse me, in the, in the college football playoff. Uh, but it's going to be a tough fight. You know, uh, don't be surprised. Uh, I won't be surprised if we see some things. But, Terry, what I also want to do is kind of on that, when we talk about college football and, you know, of course, after winning, you know, you know the, the big games and, you know, and winning the national championship, all these young people are talking about what's next, you know, what's next for these guys is the NFL. And I think that's an excellent transition that we can take right now uh, right. when we talk about, you know, going from, you know, uh, these guys who we'll see playing on New Year's uh, Day as well as throughout the week, uh, along with these guys we'll be seeing on Sunday, Thursday, and Monday night. Uh, I want to fast forward to Booger McFarland. Booger McFarland, uh, many may know, then again, many may not know, is, is a talking head, if you will, uh, you know, uh, on, on Monday Night Countdown. And just recently, uh, he said some comments that were uh, definitely uh, buzzworthy. Uh, he said some comments about uh, Dwayne Haskins being released you know, from the Washington football team. And what I want to do, Terry, I just want to share uh, some of that for us to really, you know, kind of, you know, take into account what he's talking about, hear him out, and uh, really uh, give us an opportunity to talk about the things that he brought up. Here's a uh, right. you see how teams respond to young, to young quarterback. Everything that the Washington football team put on film this year, they didn't respond mm. well to their uh, second-year quarterback. So and let me get back to a guy not being ready. When you're coming out of college, and, I, and it's crazy that I've been watching football this long, when you see guys, Adam, that, that decide to leave college early, the, one, the number one thing you, you expect them to have, you expect them to have the knowledge and expect them to have the maturity. And, and, and it's not... You know that you're coming into this game as, as, as a grown man. You still have a little yeah. little kid in you. Yes. But when I look at Dwayne Haskins, I did see a lot of youth in him, and didn't see, and I did see that he was not ready to be in the National Football. League. He admitted in his statement after Washington released him that he needed to grow up and learn from this. And when we think back on his time in Washington, what do we remember? He took a selfie with the fans yes. before the game was over. Two COVID violations this year with a head coach who's battling cancer, irresponsible. And again, that's what he basically accomplished in Washington now on the street. You know, unfortunately, I've seen this too many times. Played in the NFL almost a decade. You played a long time. We've been around it for a long time. And oftentimes, young players, especially, and I'm going to go here, especially young African-American players, because they make up 70% of this league. They come into this league and they ask themselves the wrong thing. They come into the league saying not, how can I be a better player? They don't say, how can I be a better teammate? They don't say, how can I be better, a better person? How can I get my organization over the hump? Here's what they come in saying. They come in saying, how can I build my brand better? How can I build my social media following better? How can I work out on Instagram and show everybody that I'm ready to go, but when I get to the game, I don't perform? Dwayne Haskins, unfortunately, is not the first case that I've seen like this. Yes. It's, and, and it won't be the last. And it, it bothers me because 
a lot of it is the young African-American player. They come in and they don't take this as a business. It is still a game to them. Look at this. Hey, man, I got to stop right there. I mean, you know, we, right. we could go on, you know, there's probably about three more minutes of the clip. But you know what? I'm just going to stop right there because no matter what he says going forward, he said enough. And I want to compare the two between uh, Randy Moss and Booger McFarlane's comments. Randy Moss said, hey, I don't think he was ready. But when Booger McFarlane said, hey, I'm going to take it there. I'm going to take it there. And then he says the African-American. Then he says 70% of players are African-American. And then he said, they don't do this, they don't do that. And he didn't give any leeway. So he just painted all these brothers in his position that I'm all about my brand, my brand. However, however, what, remember this? Remember Johnny Manziel, Money Manziel, throwing it up all the time and all this stuff. And they work with him and all this kind of stuff and the things that he did. Uh, remember, uh, you know, I, I speak on Baker Mayfield and his mm -hmm. transition from college to the pros. And then he later goes on and starts referencing Jamarcus Russell. Jamarcus Russell? <laughs> what, what, we, don't, we wasn't even on social media with Jamarcus Muscle Russell. He, don't even, he doesn't even fall in this. So if you got to go that far back, Terry, to make a reference point to kind of book in Dwayne Haskins, Jamarcus Russell, come on, man, give me a break. Because it seemed like, and what bothered me about that, is you and I have this platform that we share. And we're able to speak life, speak inspiration, and speak our opinion, but it's all done to the benefit of the African American community. And from a perspective that we we criticize Dwayne Haskins, yeah. we talk about the young lady that we know that has ties to Michigan and everything. But but we didn't throw him under the bus like, yeah, man, you and the rest of these players and these African American players. And what's surprising, Terry? What's surprising? This is from a black man talking. You know what I'm saying? And, and I don't care what you say. Uh, post, you know, social justice in America. We can, I'm going to speak on it. A black man named Booger at that. Booger? Booger. I'll tell you this one thing. I want to get your opinion, Terry. When Booger McFarlane first came on the scene to me, I passed no judgment, but I had a real problem with an African-American man uh, publicly being referred to as Booger. I think that's very insulting. But hey, that's you. That's your brand. But call me Booger. And it's almost like they're not just calling you Booger. What does it do for the level of respect and credibility that all the other black men have. So, so I'm not surprised at Booger McFarlane's statement. I'm straight on him. I'm good on him. And as I scrolled through social media, I saw another African-American with a Blue Lives Matter shirt on that said Booger was right. I mean, come on, you just that just proved my point. That people who are outside of the 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 the, the, the you know uh the connection that we have as African Americans dealing with this struggle in America. And I'm not saying that we can't be critical of these guys. I'm not saying we, we, we were in our yeah. last episode, episode 17. We were, but we didn't go as far as Booger McFarlane. Booger, Mc, Booger McFarlane researched this comment with the intent to put himself in a position to, I think, uh, appease white people in America to say, yeah, you're right, and down these brothers. Uh, why couldn't you pick up the phone, man, if you go go there? So that's, that's my take on Booger, man. You know, and, and you don't got to agree with me, but that's just where I'm feeling with that. No, I mean, my thing is, I thought I thought the message had it, it was kind of the right intent, but it, it was it he just met he just said it wrong, like you said. I mean, you just don't. It's more of a behavior issue than a racial issue. Like it's it's behavior. Like we see like we see kids or uh, young men, adults of all color doing some immature things. It's not just one group. I mean, like you said, Manziel, he came in. General managers didn't like him doing the money sign. They didn't like him going out drinking and going out partying. Baker Mayfield, the way that he's interacting with his coaches, the way that he's interacting with his players, the way he's interacting with the media, it's problemsome. Like, it's, it's problematic. And so we see a guy like Dwayne Haskins. People don't like to talk about how this guy wasn't fully accepted by the coaching staff. The coaching staff didn't really want him. The front office want him. Right there is a problem. You can't have a guy who, oh, my boss wants you, but I don't really want you. Do, does the coach not have to work with their quarterback to get wins? I mean, I don't think people are understanding that, that that's where the conflict really kind of is. But also, uh, I don't want to make sound making excuses, but I'm just making ex explanations. I mean, he gets drafted to his hometown. That can be a good thing, but that can also be a negative. 
You're going, you're going home. You got your buddies. You got your homeboys there. Hey, man, let's go. Let, let's go party. Let, let's, let's go here. Oh, man, you don't need to do that right now. Come on. Come on home. You back home. You home. You know what I mean? So, I mean, you get into that scenario where it's like, do I, you know, you got your boys in the back ear and you got your business. And so my whole thing about the whole business thing, tons of athletes work on their brand. Like he said, a billion dollar business. Athletes are making a whole bunch of money off their likeness, their image, them talking on a commercial. How many times have I seen a Baker Mayfield commercial? You know what I mean? And, and, I mean, and he, talk about Hulu off that commercial that he did. Right. Progressive Hulu on the Brown Stadium talking, you know, flipping burgers and stuff. Like I'm like, but we're not talking about him working on his game, but Baker can make these commercials. I mean, I, I just see, uh, I mean, does Haskins need to work on his own? Need, does he need to get a mentor? Does he need to get himself together? Yes, I completely agree with that. It's, he's lacking immaturity right now, but we're not going to act like, you know, we see quarterbacks like Josh Allen, Sam Darnold, all these different young quarterbacks, Mayfield, the team is buying into him. The coach is buying into him. We're all believed in him. Haskins has talent. I believe that Dwayne Haskins has one of the best arm talents in there. Does he need work? Yes, I agree with that. But let, let's not just throw him under the bus. You know, I felt like Booger's comments weren't really, uh, weren't really uh, positive and pushing him forward. It was more like, yo, you're doing the same thing everybody else doing. That's not how we treat a young brother out here trying to make it for himself and his family. We got to bring him up. We got to see what we can do to get him back on track. I hope Clutch Sports snags. My dad sent me a text. He was like, can Clutch Sports snag this young brother and, and get him back up to doing what he can do? You know what I mean? But it was sad to see him say that because he he marginalized and generalized a group of people who look like himself. You said it, you said it so well. And shout out to your dad, Terry McCord. Uh, senior, that would be awesome if uh, Rich Paul and company can bring him in and uh, almost give him a rebranding opportunity. You know, and I, and I think people can argue that what we're talking about, but you you made it very clear and used one word. You used it very well. It was a 50 cent word. You said marginalized. Booger McFarland's comments marginalized African Americans and it added nothing but a, a you know a, a, a black spot you know, if you will. And you made a good point, man. You said we have a role, but see that we is not always a collective we. You know, what did it say? You know, just cause you my my, my, my skin uh, folk don't mean you my kin folk. You know what I'm saying? Just cause you look like me. And Booger, as far as I'm concerned, sound like an older conservative white man talking. You do. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if you, if you, if you cover your eyes or if you just read the text, you would be offended if it was a white man saying, but Booker gets a pass. I just think that it just really showed me the true colors that Booker McFarlane is not there to hold up these young brothers, but he's decided to stand on the side of being uh, hypercritical of the culture. And he's just not somebody I would trust in helping moving these guys forward. He seems to be the guy that would uh, be there trying to keep up the status quo. But then you got, then Randy Moss, bless his heart. Damn, Randy, how long can you really sit across from him <laughs> and say all that. I mean, I mean, you know, considering from whence you came, I ain't telling you got to just let it all hang out. But you know, maybe Randy didn't think that he was gonna be painting that same picture with Booger, not knowing what Booger was gonna be talking about, or not knowing how it was gonna go over. But in my view, okay, Randy, I get it. But you know, at the end of the day, Randy, you was you you was a trip to deal with too. At one point, you know, what I'm saying you had your time. You wasn't squeaky king, clean guy. But with that being said, man, it just, I guess. I'm grateful that we do have this platform. I'm grateful that I have a young brother like yourself who's intelligent, you know, articulate and can kind of see it. And I know I'm not crazy. And I think it's worth speaking up on the other side. I'm not saying Dwayne Haskins doesn't need to work on some things and probably getting away is the best thing. You know, however, you know, dang booger, for real, your, your words were not inspiring. Don't tell, don't, don't, don't get on national TV on Monday night football booger and, and, and talk about, uh, uh, what this black kid keep doing wrong and pile on. You ain't helping nobody. You wouldn't help nobody with that. That comment then is not gonna help Dwayne Haskins. He know, and you wanna get on national TV and add your blackness as credibility to it being right. Cause all it does is add to the psyche for white America to say, yeah, booger, that's right. All these kids care about is their brand. Well, like you say, Baker got more Kirk commercials in a little bit. And Baker ain't really came and brought it. He's having a better season now. But we don't even think about that. It just gives him another reason to pile on, man. And it infuriated me. And uh, my buddy Terry was on the other end of that text message. I appreciate you, man, you know, dealing with that. But you know, we'll see. We'll see what the fallout is. But you know what, though? I'll say this lastly on that. 
the Booger McFarlands of the world, the Sage Steels of the world, who think that it's better for them to be on the side of mainstream majority when it comes down to either picking up our young brothers or letting them continue to spiral out of control without giving the right kind of confident world, your time is going to come. Your time is going to come because whether you know it or not, you are not in those roles, particularly as African-Americans, because solely because of your relationship to the white community. You're in there because of some type of relationship they believe you possess to connect to the African-American community, but you're falling short of that. And you see what happened to Sage Steele, and then came out on her, and they kind of ran her out, and ain't nobody really feeling her. And I mark my words, and I don't wish this on nobody, but Booger McFarland's time is going to be short-lived, and he ain't going to get that because of statements like this. I don't wish that on that brother, and with this world we live in, who knows, I may be running to this brother a week from now. But you know what I was saying <laughs> on my heart? I said, Booger, you hurt me when you said that. I don't think you had to say that. And I think you did that for reasons that it wasn't that was, that was for you, for your benefit, and not for our benefit. I just I just want to add one more thing about you know the whole thing about you know Booger McFarland. I mean, we're talking about a guy who's been who's been critiqued very hard on social media itself about his analyzations of, of the of the game of football, like on, on Monday Night Countdown and uh, Monday Night Football. He uh, so they say Booger was the worst. Yeah, he, they, they said he was the worst. They said that uh, when he was the, the side commentator of the guy calling the game, they'd be like, oh, man, Booger's always calling the obvious. He's always saying the obvious things. And, and like, some people, like, you know, challenged his, uh, you know, his uh, his intelligence about, about football. You know, and I'm like, well, I mean, I mean, people probably will want to challenge your intelligence. You go on the name and say your name is Booger. <laughs> I mean, come on. Somebody named, anybody named Booger. What can a person named Booger tell me they're expert act other than what? Eating boogers, right? <laughs> Why they yeah. name you Booger? And if, I don't care if it was something else, but you make a good point. I'm glad you brought that up about, and it's crazy because here's the crazy part with that. Initially, as an African-American male on TV, I'm going to want to support you, Booger. Right. I'm going to want to look past what they say are your shortcomings or look past what people may be saying about you uh, uh, that's problematic. I won't want to support you and see you be successful. So you already had this advantage. So that even speaks more to the, to the diabolical nature of what's going on here and the strategy. He said, well, you know what? I'll just flip and I'll turn on the young black quarterbacks and the young black players and I'll get in and they'll bring me in because of that. See, they are already kind of questioning. You're already potentially on the outs. So what you do is you go double down on the black athlete. You better find your way. It ain't going to last, bro. It ain't going to last because authenticity is what wins the day, good or bad and different. And if that's who you really are, so be it. You got to live with that. But you make an excellent point here. I appreciate uh, you saying that. It, it wasn't my intent to use this platform to go on. And I don't think that we've done anything inappropriate. We didn't call that man out of his name, the man named Booger. I mean, I don't know what other people say to call him out of his name. But I was <laughs> disappointed. And the time will come, I'm going to run into Booger. And uh, unless things have evolved from this, I, I will want to share that to him. And, and hope I can just get some reconciliation off that going forward. Uh, speaking of that, man, we're going to keep it moving with the show. We're doing really good with time. I want to thank the streets are talking. Uh, going to be bringing in a new year with those guys. Shout out to Clarence uh, B. Clarence before that is. And uh, Carman, that's Don Houston out of Chicago. Yeah. And Clarence out of my hometown, Detroit. And, of course, Orlando Watkins for helping us out, getting our message out as far as why to Canada. Shout out uh, to, to, to the north. We the north as well as all throughout uh, the country. But uh, getting back to what we have, man, let's talk about MSU, man, Michigan State basketball. Oh, man, it's been a rough time. Uh, for the record, uh, there was a slight rumor going around that this is the first time that Michigan State has lost three games in a row. And wrong, they lost three games in a row last season. And it wasn't, to Tom Mizzo's point, to uh, top 20 teams. So, uh, yeah, you could say people are kind of up in arms, a little worried, a little concerned. But the other part of it is, is uh, this is what Michigan State does. I mean, you think about it, you know, somebody had to bring it to my attention, Terry, that they always will drop games early in the season. And you'll be looking around saying, oh, man, what's up with Michigan State? What are they yeah. going to do? And you look up and like last year, they're sharing the Big Ten championship or they're making a, a deep run in, in, in the NCAA. So uh, I want to bring up a really interesting uh, comment that uh, Tom Izzo made. It's pretty lengthy. Uh, we'll kind of check it out for a while. Maybe we'll break it down uh, into uh, two different things, two different segments. But, uh, yeah, let me bring this up. And I want to talk about Tom Izzo referring to uh, the 
alpha dog that's needed. Uh, and we had talked about this after they lost to Minnesota. I brought it up to, hey, man, who's your alpha male, alpha dog? And that even made his way to Wally Zerbiak on the Big Ten Network last night, even bringing it up because they saw the press conference as well. So I'm going to uh, play this, and you can tell me what you think. We okay. go from there. Mr. Lindsey Huddleston. Hey, Tom, um, your comment about uh, needing an alpha dog kind of made the rounds. Uh, the Big Ten Network mentioned that in some of the – bullet points for preparing for Nebraska. I'm just curious, in the last practice, have you seen any candidates, or do you see yourself stepping into that role yourself, as you alluded to the last time you talked to him? You know, Lindsay, I mean, you're not going to all of a sudden make a guy a point guard that hasn't been a point guard. You're probably not going to make a guy a leader. I mean, you know, a lot of people say leaders are born, not made. I um, I just don't think there's as many being born. <laughs> so I think we got to make them a little bit better. And, and what does that mean? Uh, of course, it's not when they're born, born. It's it's just the, we have such a soft society right now, you know, and they want to keep making it softer, if you ask me, you know, let a kid do whatever he wants. That, And so when they're in elementary school, junior high school, I'm sure of all people, you deal with this a lot. Um, people aren't programmed to be the alpha dog, you know? I mean, we give trophies for 37th place. I mean, that's what our people want to do now. So how do you become an alpha dog if you're always satisfied for what you've done? So that's not going to change overnight, you know. I still think the Joshes and, and Aarons have to take on some of that. But I think some of it's going to have to fall on me, too. And uh, that's the round peg in a square hole again, you know. Um, I'm going to have to. I understand what's needed. Uh, I don't get to play, but that's why I've been having more meetings, more talks, more things. And I think I got to do a better job myself. So I'm going to turn it more on myself. Uh, it's not my fault that uh, our society is soft. Okay. It's not my fault that you're not allowed to, uh, to uh, demand something of an eighth grader or a junior in high school because somebody's upset about it. But guess what? It's not their fault either. It's the adult's fault in the long run. I'm the adult. I need to take that on myself and see if I can help, you know, because as you can imagine, you have everybody's attention now. And no, so everybody knows these weren't knocked down, dragged down. In fact, one day we just had a film session and didn't practice. A little different for me uh, after a loss, but I felt the right thing to do. I thought they needed some rest mentally and physically. And uh, and I'm learning as we go this year, too. You can say, well, I've got all this experience. Nobody has experience of a pandemic or what it's doing. And so um, I just I don't feel as bad as everybody feels mad because I think I understand some of the circumstances. But I don't feel as good as just be able to say, hey, we lost three games. That's the way it goes. You know, I. I listen to some people tell me, well, we haven't lost three games in a row ever, you know. We just did it last year. <laughs> you know, you just don't realize it. And it wasn't against three top 20 teams. You don't realize that. And it wasn't during a pandemic where you had no spring, summer, or fall. But everybody is in the same boat. It's just everybody handles these situations differently. And I'd say that I'm blaming the adults and society I'm an adult and I'm part of the society. So I better look in a mirror and take some of the responsibility, which I am doing, and seeing if I can help guys through some things. Uh, we made, made no bones about we lack a little leadership. It doesn't mean they're bad kids. In fact, I wouldn't trade one guy. And it doesn't mean they're not smart kids. Greatest semester we've had. It's just alpha dog is something that you develop through your first 18 years. Uh, I didn't change with Team Cleves. His mama took care of that. She didn't worry about who was at school. She, she took care of that, you know. I didn't change Draymond Green. Um, I didn't make Travis Walton. I didn't make Denzel Valentine a, a good leader. Uh, his daddy took care of that. So um, sometimes, you know, as... As we move forward here, I think everybody would agree that there's left, less leaders, softer countries. How to, so we gotta, we gotta do some things about that. 
try to take that on. So point the finger at me. You're not pointing at any of them. Appreciate okay. the question. No problem. Wow. I mean, uh, that was a little lengthy, but I still think every second was worth it. You know, as a side note, man, I'm just thankful for my relationship with Tom and being able to have these discussions. He'll be the first one to tell you that he, he's being more honest in this press conference now than before. And also in my role as a sports psychology consultant, I don't want to make it about me. You know, it's so easy to get caught up in this media thing where you're, you're, you're asking things that will highlight me in my brand, as Booger would say. Shouldn't be mentioning that no more. But, I mean, I was telling, man, I think the latter part of his comments, I mean, when he started shouting out my team, excuse me, Draymond, Travis Warden, and Denzel saying those were my alpha dogs. I've only had four or five, and, and that was it. But then also saying I'm giving myself permission to be the alpha dog. Because what he said post-game Minnesota was, you know, maybe I'll have to do it. So it's almost like he kind of came to that understanding in this discussion right here saying, well, I got to be the alpha dog. You know what that means? If Tom Mizzle saying he's going to be the alpha dog, he's about to start getting on these guys. He started about, you know, really start pushing them. And I think where the concern with that is, is that he doesn't want the backlash that comes with him being referred to as, you know, uh, an abusive coach. I think that, that sits right under the surface with him. Uh, Aaron Henry is a daily reminder of that. And I think he's trying to keep it cool, Terry, so he don't blow his top, but also uh, get caught up in this national uh, discussion about, you know, the right way to coach. So we had a lot going on in that, and I also wanted to definitely loop back around to that soft society, because I think that was a really telling statement. He was like, society's soft, and it's getting softer. And because of that, I can't even – and I, I, one thing I do like, one thing I do like is when he said eighth graders and juniors. So it puts you in a mindset of this eighth grade kid that a coach is getting on is about to get recruited by Tom Mizzo in the next 12 to 24 months. See, people don't get that. Terry, you know how this process goes. Coach Orlando Watkins knows how it goes. But to our listeners, you got to realize, especially to our Canadian listeners, and that's probably part of the follow-up we're going to have when we uh, reach out to you guys going into 2021 about what this is like. Yes, in the eighth grade, Tom Izzo is looking at your child, or if not Tom Izzo or someone. It's not their senior year that mm -hmm. they're going to, you know, get recruited by Duke or Tom Izzo. They're making this decision years and years ago. So if you're at that point, where as an eighth grader or as a junior in high school, you can't get that push without it being an issue. It can be a problem. So that was more than a mouthful. Tell me some, some of the things you picked up from Tom's comments about soft society and the anatomy of an alpha dog. No, I, I knew I knew this was going to come throughout the season. I, I, I saw the wins and wins, and I, I tried to remain positive that we wouldn't get to the point where this would be an issue. But I knew it was going to come. When you have that kind of a leader that Cassius was and Tillman was and – and how how uh, how they left and went to the NBA, you're like I mean we they these players right now weren't asked to do what Cassius did because that was taken care of, and so now like you know it's like it's like throwing like being it's like a kid going on their own like myself you know I, I'm being asked to make my own meal, make sure the trash out, make sure the kitchen clean, make sure my room's clean, all these different things that I'm like oh man I didn't always have to worry about what I was eating. I didn't always have to worry about, oh, making sure, uh, you know, always being on top of when, when stuff needs to go out, which I, I did some of that a little bit, but making sure the kitchen clean all the time, bathrooms, all that. I didn't have to worry about that. But then once I'm gone from mom and pop's house, I'm like, oh, man, this is what it's like. I got to grow into this. I got to grow every day. I got to make sure I got to, you know, continue to grow myself mentally so I can be ready for it. I think this is what we're seeing here. I mean, we're seeing guys like Aaron Henry who throughout his whole, whole career at MSU, he was with Cassius. He didn't have to worry about speaking up, being vocal. Oh, Cash got it. I'm going to just do my thing here, make sure I'm getting back on defense and make sure I'm, I'm hitting open shots sometimes. You know, that wasn't really his thing, but make sure I'm slashing in there, playing hard. That was really his role, play hard. We need Aaron Henry to play hard, rebound, play defense. Now, with Josh Langford, his thing was kind of being he – was, he was a very vocal leader, I think, before he got injured. You know, that was kind of his role his junior year with Cash. But now he's being asked after two years, get back into the flow of things, you know, start being more vocal. You know what I'm saying? Two years off, that's a long time. You know, be, and he has to be more vocal and all that. We're asking Rocket Watts, a 19-year-old, a sophomore in, in college, to be that dude, to live up to Cash's as a sophomore? 
I mean, Cassius wasn't even doing what they're asking Rocket to do as a sophomore. I mean, we got to remember, Cassius had those years, freshman, sophomore year, where we were like, ah, oh, Cat, coach is getting into Cash. Coach is getting into him. Is Cash is going to get back to his Cash is going to be up there with Miles and all them. I mean, Cash has had his time. You know what I mean? So we can't, you know, really put this amount of pressure on Rocky and all these different guys. They grow. But I think Coach Izzo is right about, you know, about the whole dog mentality and the alpha mentality. And I think he's taking the right approach. I mean, at the end of the day, a coach, you got to think about yourself. You got to think about, you know, where do I come in with them playing the way that we're playing right now? I mean, at the end of the day, I'm the head coach. I, I see these guys every day. So something that I'm doing can be improved to help these guys play better. And I think if it means like uh, having, showing the, the initiative to be the lead dog, I think once they see Coach Izzo get into them more, I think more players would be like, oh, so that's what it's like. That's what I need to do. You know, more of an example. And I think seeing Cash for however long those players have seen Cash playing, I think is going to be key for them. And I think some players need to, don't be afraid. I mean, as a leader, People aren't always going to like you or hear what you need to say. I mean, I learned that really quick. I mean, not every player is going to want to hear, hey, man, hustle up. That's not good enough. And they may be thinking like, "Damn, this dude talking about it's not good enough. I'm going my 100%. You know, what is he talking about? I right. mean, they're not always going to want to hear that. So I think that's something that I expect maybe Rocket to grow into. But I know Aaron and uh, Aaron and Josh are definitely going to improve on it as this, as this being a challenge from their coach. No, man, you make excellent points. Um you know, it's so easy, and as fans, we get so spoiled, and we just want this instant creation. And now, you know, when I get text messages from good friends, they're like, "Oh, your boy Izzo." Now, mind you, you know, uh, I'm a fan of Coach Izzo. Uh, I would consider him a friend, and we're professional colleagues as well in that regard. But also, I can see where things are going. I think that's the interesting thing about our relationship is because, as a sports psychology consultant, I'm talking about those other things that that are not the X and O's, and um, He's been a, such a guarded individual for so long, Terry, and he's this, he's very transparent now. And I even think that he kind of shifts and goes back and forth in the press conference where he wants to give some information, but he's also always covering for his guys. He's never throwing his guys under the bus. I noticed that he's never saying, you know, uh, things a, a, about them and to the extreme without taking some accountability. But I also think that this is a setup for the comeback in a sense. You about to, Hear the wrath. You're about to see the wrath. I want to say, particularly this game against Nebraska, even though Nebraska, you know, you can't even count Nebraska. They got a six nine point guard. You know what I'm saying? So, so with that being said, and you know, and and, and, and Fred Hoiberg, you know, his son is playing for Michigan State. He got this. He got this circle on his calendar. You better believe Fred Hoiberg. Hoiberg, uh, Hoiberg wants this win as well. You know, um, shout out to all the Chicago listeners, uh, former coach for the Chicago Bulls. But uh, I think it'd be something interesting to see. I think what he did do, he effectively put the alpha dog discussion to rest, you know, saying, look, man, you can't build it overnight. But why? Well, when he went back and started naming, you know, the Mateens, you know, Travis Walton, you know, uh, you know, you think about uh, other guys like, you know, uh, Denzel, you know, and, and what they did. And, and how they had a major impact. And um, when it's like that, you can't just assume that the next point guard recruiter is going to be able to do that, you know, and, and it is what it is. So with the time we have, man, um, uh, based on your uh, excellent production of this show, man, you know, you put something out there, man, talking about, you know, 2021, you know, and I know it's almost been kind of taboo to even talk about 2021, you know, in a certain way because everything we've gone through in this year, man, but I really like the question that you pose, you know, talk about goals. And as you remember, I came back at you with the KATP, baby. Keep, you know, you know uh, keep applying the pressure. And, and what do I mean by that? I just think that going forward for not only SPS, for our SPS show, or, you know, uh, the message I'm trying to get out, you know, almost my pre-Monday motiv Monday motivation message, keep applying the pressure, man, and apply pressure to the world, apply pressure to your life and the things you're working on in a way that's equivalent to how COVID-19 applied pressure to all our lives. I don't say that lightly. I don't say that with any disrespect to the lives that were lost and our lives challenged, but COVID has been a constant, a constant in our lives. Uh, you can't walk out the door without being COVID conscious, if you will. It was constantly on our mind and we constantly had to do things every day to be able to navigate through that. And uh, we did it to live. We did it to be able to enjoy our loved ones, Terry. But now I'm saying for 2021 going into it, man, focus on your goals the same way. You know, when you get up in the morning, are you goal-orientated? When you go to bed at night, 
are you goal oriented? I mean, keep that pressure on. I mean, with COVID, man, for for the most part, when it first hit early on in summer months, man, you know, we you know we didn't even know what to do when we left outside, you know, you know, and even there's still a lot of questions looming. But I just want to tell people to keep applying the pressure for what we're going to be doing here, man. We're going to continue to upgrade what we have. Uh, look to bring some more interesting things, just like the conversation that we were having uh, recently. Uh, even with my particular platform, stepping my game up as far as the graphics, as far as you know uh, the content as it relates to making sure we're staying on point with a message that can be inspiring, motivating, adding the music to what's going on. That's an example of what I mean by uh, keep applying the pressure to your life and what you have going on. And if you need any kind of comparison on how to compare, you know, do that. Think about COVID-19 and the pandemic, how it applies pressure. So what are your thoughts, Terry? Yeah, I agree with that. And I, a little bit what I touched on earlier, I think a lot of people <clears throat> realize and think that you know, I've come to the realization that 2020 was such a bad year. I, I would honestly argue with that. I, I believe has 2020 had some very down moments for most people like myself? Yeah. But I would say that 2020 has probably been one of the most revealing, re revealing uh, year in a while. I mean, we're talking about um, the, you know, we haven't really seen the Black Lives Matter movement being pushed so hard until this year. We haven't really seen the issues of healthcare and everyone being accounted for and being able to have the access to affordable healthcare. We haven't seen people really touch on, you know, healthcare period. I mean, a lot of times people forget about that but because of COVID, everyone's like, do, do we have enough insurance to cover for this? Is it affordable for us? These are problems that have, have always been here but we don't really hear about those. I mean, we see the thing with college sports how much money that we're losing because of COVID, should we be paying these athletes? These athletes are generating a lot of revenue for these schools. And so we're seeing that. We're seeing um, things going around. I mean, it's just a lot of different things that we see come to play. Uh, we see things like with the NBA, you know, we're seeing athletes, professional athletes, period. Should they be silenced or should they keep doing what they need to be doing? Are they, are they willing to take the heat from fans and other people who may be saying, oh, they need to stop stop talking about that. Keep politics out of sports. We're starting to see how politics and sports kind of go hand in hand. And so, I mean, 2020 has brought a lot of things. And so when you say keep applying the pressure, I believe that, you know, keep applying the pressure towards that. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like we were able to see, you know, uh, social injustice, uh, things happen in America. Don't just forget about it just because it's not really trending so much. Those things aren't going to go away. That's what they want us to do. They want us to be all hyped and be like that for two months. And then after it all blow past, oh, yeah, we're just going to keep doing the same thing. Or they, they don't really want it. They don't really, they're not going to talk about it anymore. They want it to like slowly pass away like a wave. But no, we got to keep applying the pressure. Same thing like with my goals, you know, I set a goal for myself today. I, I was like, I, I'm going to find out a logo for my podcast. And I'm going to get a name and I'm going to keep going. That, that was my goal for the day. Yes. Yes. So you got to find different things to keep going and apply yourself to uh, 2021 or it's going to be the same year. And, and I challenge people to look, find the positives of 2020, find good things about it. I mean, a good thing was me joining this show. I mean, this show has been great. It's been a great influence on me being able to, you know, research, uh, getting access, talking to different people, impacting different lives. I think that's been a key for me. Uh, LCC has been a key, being able to stay home, impact people around me. Instead of going to MSU right now, you know, I think it's been key for me to stay home, uh, you know, be around people, impact kids around when I do streets, you know what I mean? So I, I think it's been a great year, Have has a lot, I mean, the way that I want to think about it and hopefully 2021 keeps bringing blessings for a lot of people's families, a lot of people, and continue to push on forward and apply that pressure. Yeah, man, you, you have a very great perspective. And I like the example that you gave for your own life. Say, hey, I'm going to get this logo and I'm going to get this name and I'm going to move forward. That's huge for you. And I think that's an excellent example of how we can have something that's personal to us that, that, that we've been thinking about, we've been mulling over, and now we're finally at a point where we can move on with it. So I appreciate that example. An example that you set on this show, man, you, you've been an excellent addition to this. Uh, without you and Orlando both, uh, we wouldn't have this going. You helped motivate me. And even from a mental health standpoint, knowing that there's going to be an opportunity that if the Booger McFarlands of the world say things, that we have a platform that we can respond in an intelligent, informed way. Also being able to have a message that's, you know, uh, positive for people all the way around 
uh, to lift people up, man. I can't tell you how excited I am when I look at my calendar. And I say, oh, man, I got to get ready for the show. Hit my guy Terry up. I said, what are we thinking about? And you do an excellent job and just gleaning all the issues from the news. I mean, down to the very last thing that may pop up. And here we go. We get this opportunity to get out here and exchange, you know, and pass this on. I think it says a lot, man. And then also to stay with the theme of keeping applying the pressure, just keep get up and, and, and drop it every day you're supposed to drop it. We drop our podcast every Thursday at six o'clock and like clockwork, we're on here, you know, and that's the thing. And I think sometimes people get so caught up in, uh, uh, am I making progress in my movement? At the end of the day, man, you got to just keep hitting that hammer, you know, on its head, you know, to make it, you know, uh, move on to, to that point you want it to be that. So I'm looking at the time right now. We're doing an excellent job with time. We're right at the hour mark. I, again, I want to thank the Streets of Talking Podcast Network, uh, Don. Houston, as well as Clarence Board, doing a great job. It, it, it went from a discussion in March. Here we are uh, getting ready to bring in the new year in uh, several time zones. And Terry, again, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you, uh, your family, uh, your friends and connected with you. And I look forward to an excellent 2021. And also to Coach Orlando Watkins, man, I wouldn't do it without you. Uh, you've been such a great help for us, uh, referring to you being uh, Nassau, you know, and we are out here. You are Houston, that is, and we're Nassau. We're out here doing it. So I'm going to cut it short so we can uh, get this thing set up, locked down. But next time we talk to you guys, it'll be 2021. We're going to keep applying that pressure, and it's going to be better uh, next year and the years to come. So with that, I want to thank you guys, and we'll see you guys next year.